Hello everybody! I have not made a video in English for quite a while, but now I was feeling like ranking something for YouTube and I thought I should make something that probably doesn't even exist on YouTube, or at least I couldn't find it. I certainly like the idea of ranking things that are not particularly well represented, so something more unique than the usual uh, ranking of Pink Floyd albums, although I should do that one probably as well. <laughs> so this is a ranking video regarding all volumes of the Corto Maltese comics drawn and created by the Italian artist Ugo Pratt between 1967 and 1991. Corto Maltese is easily one of my favorite comic characters, most likely the favorite. He's the perfect foil for my escapistic thoughts and probably a good remedy against my increasingly bitter thoughts about the state of the world. There is a new word around, it's called anemoia, coined by John Koenig. It's an expression which captures a sense of nostalgia for a time beyond my own, maybe even a time and place that did not exist in this exact form I'm yearning for. The world of Corto Maltese is a strange fiction where history and mythology collide, but it is also a world of melancholy and nostalgia, of restlessness and wanderlust, while at the same time thriving on moments of absolute peace and calm. So there is a very romantic notion of aimlessness, but also a degree of stoic thinking. But it can also be very surreal and the story can achieve all kind of psychedelic or dreamlike states. And it can also be somewhat goofy, reminding us that the entire life can be perceived as a comedy. It certainly is the proper zone for escapism. First, a few minor caveats. So the one point that needs to be clarified is about the epigons, about the continuation of the story after Hugo Pratt's death. This took a while, but today the new Corto stories come from Juan Díaz Canales and Ruben Pejero. Now back in the day I was more bullheaded about it, thinking it's not Hugo Pratt, I'm not interested. But Pratt made only 12 volumes, and I'm not crazy about each one of them, so it is a very limited well to drink from. So one day I thought I should probably give these two guys a chance, particularly because their production is not careless or reckless. On the contrary, sometimes it even feels like they are almost too respectful towards the original. So I started to read their books, and they are great! <laughs> So, of course, I will include them in my ranking. It's a four additional volume that they had drawn in the course of the last, I think, 10 to 12 years. What I will not consider in this ranking are the two new reboot stories by Bastien Vives and Martin Kenehan, namely Océan Noir and La Reine de Babylon, which came out this year. I am not too familiar with those books. They look good. It is a new approach to Corto Maltese placing the story into the 21st century, and that's fine. I think mythology can be flexible, and I will give those two volumes a proper look soon. But they are not part of this lore or world building we are talking about now, which takes place at the beginning of the 20th century. So I don't include those two here. And uh, while I present my ranking, I will try to jump between the German, English and French titles, so it is clear which book I mean. Some have the same title in every language, but some have rather different titles. Anyway, enough of the opening speech and uh, let's get on with it. So this is my personal ranking of the 16 comic books about Corto Maltese. Number 16. Die Schweizer, Les Helvetiques. Uh, so uh, when things are being ranked, something needs to be the last. I choose a rather late volume from the series called The Secret Rose in the English language editions, which in Germany is actually called Die Schweizer, meaning the Swiss. We meet here Hermann Hesse and Tamara de Lempica in this story, but I would say of all the rather metaphysical and esoteric Colto Martese stories, this is the most 
fairy tale like and the most dreamlike in this constant dichotomy between the metaphysic and the historical nostalgia the two major themes in Quarto Maltese I do gravitate towards the latter and I can stomach some uh, esoteric stuff by Hugo Pratt but this volume is entirely ornate with uh, European mysticism and occultism which can be fine uh, but honestly I think it works better in uh, Fable of Venice it is also entirely possible that this book is filled with some unique humor that is a little bit lost on me, but who knows, um, the years will tell. Number 15, Tango. Tango is a solid story from the world of organized crime in Buenos Aires of the early, of the early 20th century. And in a sense, it is probably the most sad of all Corto Maltese comics. For me personally, the volume suffers a bit from the fact that uh, Hugo Pratt was kind of half-assing the drawing a bit. I mean, he was always an artist looking for ways to shorten, to shorten the workload, maybe because he didn't want to become dependent on assistants like, for example, Hergé. He used a lot of chiaroscuro so he could draw large parts of a panel just black but around this time he started to use these giant speech bubbles filled with only a few words and otherwise being mostly empty I guess simply to cover as much of the panel as possible so he didn't need to draw the scenery and the background around it and I take a bit of umbrage at that it gives me it, it gives the comic a somewhat uh, cartoonish vibe and I mean even if you look at his very early volumes it is pretty obvious that Hugo Pratt hated to draw backgrounds, forests and so he couldn't draw them fast enough. <laughs> that being said it is a very willful story taking place around the bordelos uh, and the Jewish mafia in Buenos Aires and corrupt police. It is uh, conspicuous that Hugo Pratt was done working for the for the PIF magazine so he didn't need to be so child friendly in his stories anymore. Number 14, the early years, Abenteuer einer Jugend, La Jeunesse. So this is the prequel with events preceding the Ballad of the Salty Sea by eight years. It is important to recognize that this is an unfinished and abandoned project. So this volume represents around 30% of the result that Hugo Pratt originally envisioned before it was aborted. I don't know too much about the reasons, only that uh, Pratt had a falling out with Le Matin de Paris, the magazine that was publishing this story. What we got is the first third, the part where we learn how Corto Maltese met Rasputin for the first time. The story seems to be told mostly from the perspective of Jack London, who is in, Man in the Manchuria at the behest of a newspaper he works for. Corto appears relatively late in the story, which is a result of the structural problem that this was supposed to be a much larger story arc, where Corto and Rasputin travel to Africa together to find the treasure of Salomon, which they talk about in the story here. And later they end up in Chile or I think Argentina, but this story was never made. In itself, uh, the, the early years, or La Jeunesse, is a good story from the final days of the Russo-Japanese War in 1904 and 1905. The narrative lies heavily on the, on the historiographical side and much less on the, on the metaphysical side, which are these two opposing extremes of the Corto Maltese lore. But obviously this could have been a much stronger story if it had been finished. Number 13, Mu, Mu the Lost Continent. Hugo Pratt's last volume of Corto Maltese, the number 12, is also the biggest one as far as the page count is concerned. That is some huge brick right there. The story is actually rather convoluted, but the entire book is a callback to the second volume under the sign of Capricorn where Tristan Bantam has this unexpected vision of some strange ancient world. Here in this book uh, uh, Levi Colombia organizes an expedition to an island in the Caribbean that is supposed to be a part of the lost world of Mu. 
so basically Atlantis. The story is fascinating, albeit not great. The strength of this volume comes rather from all the references to well-known speculations about Atlantis, so there are a lot of interesting table talks on board of Levi Columbia's ship. Those parts I find rather more interesting than the action itself, which is probably something a lot of readers see very differently. The story is probably set in 1925, which means on the timeline it is the latest Corto Maltese story we have. Corto is already 38 years old here and the oldest we will ever experience him, at least for now. Um, this or the following year the enigmatic captain supposedly disappears without a trace. His African friend Kush tells uh, 20 years later to the main protagonist of the Desert Scorpions, another series by Hugo Pratt set in the same universe, that Corto Maltese died in the Spanish Civil War. Of course, we do not need to believe that, but it is interesting how the two artists who continue con Corto Maltese now still haven't dared to create a story that goes beyond Mu in regard of the timeline. All those stories created now by Juan Diaz Canales and Ruben Pellejero are filling gaps between already existing volumes. Uh, there is a lot to like here and many aspects of the story are intriguing and fascinating. It is a very fantastic story, almost like a journey into another dimension. But uh, part of me feels also a little let down by it, probably because all this was suggested at the very beginning of the series in the before mentioned second volume Under the Sign of Capricorn. So this is actually the resolution years later, many years later, but it feels like the anticipation was maybe a little too strong. So Mu in some parts doesn't live up to its potential, I think. But don't don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of enchanting and humorous stuff going on here and I almost certainly would not go so far to call the entire volume a disappointment. It is just a little more whimsical and effervescent than I would have expected, but still a good fun. Number 12. Under the Midnight Sun, Unter der Mitternachtssonne or Sous le Soleil de Minuit. So this is the first one here by Canales and Pejero, the artist's task to continue Corto Maltese. What shoes to fill? Trying hard to appease the ghost of Hugo Pratt, this volume feels a bit uh, like a pastiche now and then. The other thing I would criticize has to do with the, with, the, with the appearance of real people. Now this was always something that Hugo Pratt did. Corto Maltese meeting famous people often before they become famous, but I think the critics and the readers started to put a little too much emphasis on that, making too much of a thing out of it, the people that Corto encountered. I think it is distracting a bit from the real heart of the story, and Hugo Pratt himself started to overindulge this part in his later volumes, and here in this volume there's a lot going on with known people that have actually lived in this era. It is not a problem, but it tends to become too much of a thing, like a panopticum. But um, that is just my personal point of view. Anyway, this is a lovely story that takes Corto Maltese north of the polar circle. So an unusual setting for the journeyman who probably prefers the southern sun in parts, the narrative is a little too busy, but still great stuff in regard of the timeline. The story is taking place in 1915, so directly after the events of the Ballad of the Salty Sea and before the events of Under the Sign of Capricorn. Most of the time we are in northern Canada and in the frozen Beaufort Sea. We enter a world of indigenous Americans, explorers, scoundrels, gold miners and prostitutes. The polar circle is a bit of an unusual environment for Corto Maltese. But I think it works. The story can benefit from a second reading because since it is so busy it is easy to lose the plot a little bit. Number 11. Celtic Tales. Die Kelten, Les Celtic. 
Um, this was the fourth volume and the first time where Corto Maltese left the surroundings of Tropical Exotica. So I remember I was a little tentative with this one, thinking that Corto Maltese doesn't belong in Europe, only in the southern Pacific and Amazonian rainforests. But this turned out to be a quite a wonderful collection of six rather whimsical stories. Particularly the first two episodes are quite brilliant. The first one is an encounter with Venice, where Corto Maltese solves a bit of a mystery. Venice was Hugo Pratt's city, so he was keen to make the city look very exciting. The other story takes place in North Italy between the battlefields of World War I and is basically a complex heist story, just not inside some bank vault, but on the front lines of war, where a bunch of British and Italian officers try to steal a treasure. Hugo Pratt creates here the atmosphere of historical urgency over Europe, while at the same time exploring European mythology and the Anglo-Saxon and, and Celtic legends. So it is a weird juxtaposition of dreamlike states on one hand and a rather gritty realism of the world war on the other. But that is something that uh, Hugo Pratt loved to dig into. That is why I consider the, the Corto Maltese stories to be part of the um, sometimes little elusive subgenre of magical realism more associated associated with Latin American novelists of the 40s and 50s or with Haruki Murakami maybe but intentionally or not Hugo Pratt was creating magical realism with Corto Maltese for sure number 10 beyond the windy isles und immer ein Stück weiter corto toujours un peu plus loin so this volume is an immediate continuation of Under the Sign of Capricorn. And considering Hugo Pratt's original work, I would even regard the ballad of the Salty Sea, Under the Sign of Capricorn and Beyond the Windy Isles as a kind of a trilogy, the tropical trilogy, if you like. Beyond the Windy Isles, um, which in German is called Und immer ein Stück weiter, is a collection of five stories, all loosely connected with each other and all set in the Caribbean and uh, along the South American coastline. This volume has some interesting stories and uh, some rather iconic panels. I like the German title here, which is derived from the French title Corto toujours un peu plus loin. The German und immer ein Stück weiter means translated and always a little further which is actually taken from a poem by James Elroy Flecker called The Golden Journey to Samarkand. But it is such an apt notion about the spirit and nature of Corto Maltese, always a little further, never stand still, but always on the move through your life, which certainly defies the idea that Corto Maltese is a nihilistic or nihilistic character, he is laconic, true, but he is driven by an inner sense of purpose. Number nine. The Golden House of Samarkand. Um, probably another title taken from the James Ellery Flecker poem. The title of this volume is uh, also a little bit misleading because it suggests that this story takes place in Uzbekistan, in the beautiful city of Samarkand. But this is a story of a journey through the Middle East and Central Asia. And we actually never really get properly to Samarkand, only to the vicinity, because it was never about that. The Golden House of Samarkand is an ironic name of a rather gruesome Turkish fortress that serves as a prison. And so while Corto Maltese pretends to be in search of an old Persian treasure, he's actually hasting to this fortress because his friend Rasputin is being held there. The story has a restless quality to it. It is like a road movie through the Middle East during the days of the Young Turks and Anwar Bey and Mustafa Kemal. The narrative strikes a good balance between those to uh, before mentioned central themes of Corto Maltese, which is the, on the one hand, the nostalgia in a geopolitical code, and on the other hand, a dreamlike metaphysical play with regional mythology on the other. Um, so 
The mysterious aspect is somewhat heightened through the peculiar fact that Corto Maltese seems to have a doppelganger in this story, uh, someone who is not only extremely similar looking to him, but also a friend of Enver Pasha. And once again, we are thrown into the middle of the great game between Turkish, French, British, Russian, Kurdish and Uzbek forces in a complex regional conflict of real historical magnitude and yet one that most people in the West probably don't know anything about. Uh, number 8. Fable of Venice, Venezianische Legende, Fable de Venice. After Hugo Pratt created this wonderful Venice story in the Celtic Tales, it was not surprising that he would return to Venice as a stage for Corto Maltese. This time a whole volume takes place inside the Lagoon City. The story is more abstract and certainly more in the esoteric realm, continuing Hugo Pratt's uh, ideas about dreamlike states and the magical realism. It is a highly charming meditation over a city where we encounter Freemasons, poets, Kabbalistic rabbis and of course highly charismatic enticing women. We encounter Louise Bruxowitz, which is a Hugo Pratt's variation on the actress and flapper icon Louise Brooks, the Bob hairstyle included, just with a different, apparently Jewish background. Usually the characters in uh, Corto Maltese stories are either fictional or historical. But there is the exception of Rasputin and Louis Brooks, whom Pratt uses in a sort of uh, semi-historical manner by using their likeness as an inspiration, but generally making them very different people. So, Fable of Venice is a very fascinating adventure in a famous uh, history-laden city that has inspired many artists. With a romantic yet mysterious atmosphere somewhere between Gustav Meyrink and Richard Halliburton, it is beautifully drawn. Once again, Pratt seemed to be beholden to the city of Venice, so he was on his A-game during this project. Number 7. Nacht in Berlin. Nocturne Berlinois. Berlin at night. Berlin at night is the last project that Canales and Pejero created um, this book came out last year and takes, takes us to Berlin during the Weimar years. As far as the timeline is concerned, this story sequels directly uh, Corto Maltese's visit uh, to Switzerland, but unsurprisingly this story is less fairy tale like and certainly more grounded in a historical realism of this city in this particular moment in time, with all the political and economical unrest of course, we meet uh, Marlene Dietrich, how could we not? But the journey takes us also to Prague, uh, the hometown of Dr. Steiner, and who is uh, one of Corto Maltese's closest friends. And taking Corto to Prague is something that Hugo Pratt would have done himself had he lived longer. I'm pretty certain of that. The city of the Golem, come on. Berlin at night is undoubtedly the best drawn Corto Maltese story. I really stand by that. And the colorization is here, maybe for the first time, an integral part of the concept, bringing the Berlin of the 20s, uh, this extremely complicated chapter in German history, visually and also emotionally alive. This is a very unique and very well done Corto Maltese album and artistically quite stunning. It is the last one that Canales and Pejero did, and one can only wonder where they will go from here. Number 6. Equatoria. So uh, Juan Díaz Canales and Ruben Pejero's second effort to continue the adventure of Corto Maltese is actually incredible. Now they reach their top form, taking us from Alexandria through the Red Sea down to Zanzibar, and from there to the failed and short-lived state called Equatoria. This story truly checks all boxes of the good old Corto Maltese nostalgia. I like the part of the story that takes place uh, in Alexandria in Egypt, including an attempted assassination of the young 
politician Winston Churchill during his visit to Egypt, but uh, the atmosphere of the of, of southern Sudan and East Africa is also very enchanting and escapistic. This is a truly wonderful comic that beautifully slips into the gaps on the timeline. If I had to criticize one thing here, then it is the sometimes little hasty pacing, but that has to do with the fact that these continuations of Corto Maltese are now much more streamlined, so basically you have to stick exactly to the 72 pages format. Now Hugo Pratt didn't have to care about those things, some of his stories turned out to be 120 pages even more. Canales and Pejero don't have this luxury. Number 5. Under the sign of Capricorn, Sous les signes du Capricorn, im Zeichen des Steinbock. This is the second volume from the world of Corto Maltese. Hugo Pratt must have been exhausted from drawing the Ballad of the Salty Sea for over two years, so for a while he created shorter stories that were published in the Piff magazine. Um, these stories are set at least half a year after the events uh, of the Ballad of the Salty Sea and take mostly place in the coastal region uh, of South America between Paramaribo in Guyana and Salvador de Bahia in Brazil. A lot of the themes in this book have to do with the Macumba, which is around Golden Rosemouth. Hugo Pratt presents these Macumba witches as a mixture of a secret feminine organization uh, and a organized crime ring. I feel like some of the best Corto Maltese moments take place in this volume. This book can be truly magical in the sense of nostalgia and escapism. Hugo Pratt's portrayal of South American natives is outstanding, so this volume has a lot of the charm that drew me towards uh, Corto Maltese in the first place. Number 4. Tarawan, All Saints Day. This was the third effort by Canales and Pejero to continue the tales of Corto Maltese, and this time they went surgically precise to a particular event in time, basically creating an immediate prequel to the Ballad of the Salty Sea, which begins with uh, Rasputin fishing Corto Maltese out of the Pacific after Corto's crew tied him to a wooden cross and threw him overboard. And Corto never really explained to Rasputin what actually had happened, so this is the story how this all came together. And this is quite a beautiful chance for us to go back to the southern seas, to Micronesia and the Pacific, and get another doses of charming yet melancholic escapism. But we also visit Tasmania and Sarawak on the island of Borneo. The story is beautifully written and extremely coherent. It is a melancholic journey through the southern seas, but also a story of love and betrayal. Of course, we meet some old acquaintances, Rasputin and Cranio, but also the enigmatic monk. I expected this to be intriguing, but it turned out to be pretty great, so I can even forgive Ruben Pejero that he uses digital color gradients to create the, the evening sky. Those are the times we live in. Number three, the Ethiopians, the Ethiopia. Umberto Eco once wrote, he feels awkward about Corto Maltese being in the desert and on the Horn of Africa because Corto Maltese belongs not into the desert, he is a maritime character. Fair enough, but I felt the same with the previous volume where Corto went to the good old Europe during the World War I. And Corto Maltese in Ethiopia, in Yemen and in Somalia, that sounds exciting to me. Besides, at this point, I, I had already read the Desert Scorpions, which take place in the same region just 20 years later, on the eve of World War II. So I knew how well Hugo Pratt is capable to evoke this region, since this is one of the places where he grew up as a teenager. Um, this volume contains only four stories. Those are the last contributions Hugo Pratt did for the French Piff magazine before returning to the long format again. This is one of my favorite volumes from this universe. I think this is amazing stuff. It is one of those volumes that are less esoteric or surreal and much more grounded 
in the geopolitical realities, but always interested in exploring how those geopolitical realities actually unfold on the ground with real people affected by them. Here we encounter the charismatic and assertive Kush, uh, who quickly becomes uh, Corto Maltese's close friend. Anyway, this is a wonderful journey from the eastern Sahel region towards East Africa with a lot of heat and a lot of sun and quite some adventures. Great stuff for a cold winterly Sunday afternoon when I would make myself an Earl Grey tea and disappear in this magical nostalgic world. More than, more than anything, Hugo Pratt is the master of the educated escapism. Number two. The Ballad of the Salty Sea, Una Ballata del Mare Salato. The beginning of it all, the lonely masterpiece of the late 60s with the tautology in the title. This album has a lot of very iconic panels that have cemented this secretive cult around Corto Maltese that I'm apparently part of. It is a fascinating masterpiece that might have baffled the readers while it first appeared in the Sergeant Kirk magazine, particularly because of all the interesting choices Hugo Pratt makes here. A less known chapter of history, a less known region of the world, being the, the Bismarck archipelago north of Papua New Guinea. Corto appears very Nihilistic here, a true anti-hero only interested in his own advantage. In the following volumes, Hugo Pratt certainly gave him more humanity and more sophisticated interests and tastes. But here he appears to be as dangerous and unreliable as the rest of the pirate gang around the mysterious warlord called Monaco or the Monk. But it is certainly the sense of nostalgia, the notion of melancholy and the longing for distant shores that make up the design of this escapistic gem. It may sound almost a little cheeky on my part that I don't place it on place number one, as many would probably, but from a more critical point of view, Hugo Pratt is still searching for his voice here regarding Corto Maltese. Some of the moments in the story feel a bit heavy-handed, but that doesn't take anything away from this unique atmosphere of this volume. I just find the other story, simply put, a little more mature. And finally, number one, Corto Maltese in Siberia. Surprisingly a story not set in tropical nostalgia, so this volume is sometimes being a little bit underrated in my book, maybe because it is probably the one Corto Maltese story that is more overstressed with historical context than any other. And that's probably off-putting to some. Once again, Hugo Pratt chooses a lesser-known historical event around the Siberian regional conflicts at the end of World War I, mostly a, civ mostly a civil war between the Russian Bolsheviki and the Tsarist White Guards, but also a volatile conflict including the Chinese Kuomintang, regional warlords and Mongolian freedom fighters, and with a strong involvement of the British and the Americans. So you will probably need pen and paper while reading this dense, fascinating adventure in Central Asia. And I understand that some people don't like that, but uh, I was immediately enchanted by the sense of urgency this story has and surprisingly how much of it is actually true and had happened that way. But I also like Hugo Pratt's drawings here. This is some of my favorite work of his. There is some great stuff on the pages and some bold artistic decisions. And a large part of the story at the beginning takes place in Hong Kong, which is beautifully colorized by Patrizia Zanotti. So for me, this is one of the best Corto stories and certainly the biggest adventure, including the mercurial character of Rasputin, who is sometimes portrayed as this antagonist or villain to Corto Maltese, but is actually one of his closest friends. That's Hugo Pratt's humor in a nutshell, a friend that constantly threatens to kill you. So that's it. This was uh, my ranking of the 16 volumes of the mighty Corto Maltese, um, started in 1967 and still being continued today. I hope you have enjoyed this or found it in any way interesting. Um, if not, I'm sorry about that. I tried.
Have a nice day.